Thank you. Thank you for coming today. And, well, maybe I should start off by saying that what I'm going to try to do today is to briefly show some connections between the humanities, foreign policy, and national security. Okay? And what I'd like to emphasize is that to engage on the world stage, be it in current political traumas or long-term transformational tra trajectories, understanding the cultural basis of foreign societies is critical. People in diverse regions of the world ground their actions and their reactions on customs, faiths, philosophies, sometimes even myths, which Americans need to know in order to mitigate conflict, generate cooperation, and enhance socioeconomic growth at home and abroad. We're all interconnected, and our values and beliefs can create common ground to avoid, whenever possible, the path of blood and uh, pain, which medieval Persian poets like Rumi, Rumi is actually the best-selling poet in the United States, uh, Rumi in the 13th century talked about that. So, you know, there are connections across time and across space. The humanities research and education play vibrant and vital roles in assisting the United States, its departments, officers, and citizens to, in determining, comprehending, and analyzing and also responding appropriately to national security and other global challenges. Practitioners of the humanities do so through study and dissemination of knowledge on foreign languages, religions, histories, cultures. <clears throat> Federal and state agencies, universities, and scholars involved in the humanities take contributing positively to national security and other international challenges very earnestly. Likewise, federal funding has and should continue to not merely sustain, but to invigorate scholarship in the humanities so that new avenues can be charted which benefit both American society generally and US decision making specifically. In a free society like ours, university-based research centers and their faculty interact constantly with private think tanks and government agencies. Moreover, the flow of scholars between universities and the government is a hallmark of the American political system. Those interactions facilitate transmission of knowledge from academic settings to decision and policy implementation settings, and also carry back to academia the concerns and needs of diplomats, generals, and advisors. I learned the many languages necessary for my chosen geographical areas of study, namely the Middle East, Central Asia, and South Asia, for the most part as an undergraduate at Columbia University and subsequently as a graduate student at Harvard. Faculty with experience generated through years of research and teaching generously shared their intellectual resources and pedagogical skills with me. Education in the humanities, including the great books of the West and the East, combined with immersion in the cultures of countries like Iran and Pakistan through both classwork and fieldwork to prepare me for better understanding those troubled societies. The NEH, a federal agency on whose oversight board, the National Council on the Humanities, I have the privilege of serving, has a well-established track record of funding research projects whose findings contribute directly and indirectly to preparing Americans for the challenges of a complex world. In so doing, the NEH facilitates an integration of humanistic knowledge with the practical necessities of our great nation's national and international commitments. Iran has held the United States' attention and vexed our leaders since the Islamic Revolution there in 1979. The most comprehensive collection of knowledge on Iran's present and past conditions is the Encyclopedia Iranica, being compiled at Columbia University. This multi-year ongoing project, whose data is now available online, is an international scholarly undertaking supported in part by American taxpayers through the NEH. The Arab Spring, or popular uprisings that have gripped countries from Libya to the Yemen, are largely fueled not by Islamic fundamentalism, but by desires for representative governments, mitigation of, cor of uh, corruption, and economic opportunities. Last year, the NEH provided financial subvention through its peer-reviewed grant process for the production of a public radio series by America, media, uh, America Broad Media, 
which examines the Arab world's demographic dilemma, the dilemma of restless youth who face both unemployment and disenfranchisement. And if I may say so, it was a very timely project. Attempts by pariah regimes from Tehran uh, to North Korea uh, to procure uranium for uh, <laughs> nuclear programs has gained considerable tension from US administrations in recent years. The African continent supplied between 25 to 50 percent of the world's radioactive ore during the past six decades. A field study at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, funded by the NEH in 2009, examines not only the history of uranium production in Africa, but also how those nations utilize mineral resources to position themselves within global technological circles. Not only is China the world's most populous nation, its economy has now taken the number two spot after the US. Chinese political expansion into the Indian Ocean and across the Asian and African continents is picking up steam too. Since 2004, the NEH has materially supported the China Biographical Database compiled, compiled uh, by Harvard University's East Asian specialists. Bridging regional rivalries, that project involves scholars from Beijing University and Taiwan's Academia, uh, Academia Sinica as well. So both valuable knowledge and cultural connections are being made. Newspapers are among the best and often the only primary sources for information on events in developing countries. Even texting and tweeting have not yet eclipsed newspapers. <laughs> in fact, now newspapers are going online and are read that way. So in 2007, the NEH began funding preservation and access to Latin American newspapers, uh, access of uh, Latin American newspapers at the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago. As a result, the contents of those publications can now be examined by security experts, scholars, and students alike to determine the trajectories of political, social, and other developments, to, de to read about those from multiple perspectives. At Indiana University's Bloomington campus, where I have taught for the past 17 years, bachelor's level students can choose from 82 languages to match their educational needs with professional trajectories. The opportunities available to for acquiring linguistic proficiency range from Mongolian to Somali. Indeed, all 16 most critical languages in the DOD's uh, language list are taught at Indiana University. Indiana University is the home to 10 US Department of Education Title VI funded language and regional studies centers, including those for African studies, Islamic studies, and Latin American studies. In addition, IU has seven national resource centers specializing in research on critical issues and areas, such as the Center for the Study of Global Change, the Inner-Asian and Uralic National Resource, uh, Resource Center, and the East European, Russian and East European Institute. Students intent on pursuing careers in the US government and NGOs receive FLAS fellowships through those NRCs. The United States recognized through the inhumane events of 9-11 that knowledge of lesser known cultures and languages is absolutely necessary to successfully implementing foreign policy and strategic interventions. So the Indiana Complex Operations Partnership between the National Guard and Indiana University began training second lieutenants in foreign languages and cultures. INCOP, as it is called, INCOP's contextualized intensive language program involves three months of study in either Pashto or Dari, while engaging in Afghan role plays and social encounters. 25 students participated in the pilot program, with approximately two-thirds of them achieving, in the space of three months, elementary proficiency on the defense uh, language aptitude test. I'm told that most of those brave young, and, uh, young men and women are now in the AFPAC uh, military theater. So it's practical application of knowledge from the humanities. However, however, academic and policy stovepipes do not always align so positively. Between 1984 and 1991, while conducting anthropological and archaeological research in Pakistan's Balochistan province, 
I observed the proliferation of Baluch and, and Pakhtun madrasas. Drawings by young, impressionable students on the walls of those elementary and secondary schools. So they're really not madrasas, they're maktabs or just elementary school and secondary schools. Uh, drawings on the walls equated Soviets and Russians killing Afghan families between 1979 and 1988 to Americans and Israelis fighting Palestinian civilians. I saw similar images on schools in Kota Baru on the northeastern shores of Malaysia during a dissertation workshop sponsored by the American Council of Learned Societies and the Social Science Research Council in 1990. The humanities education I received made me realize that although we shared the goals of life and liberty, my American understanding of the pursuit of happiness was very different from that which school children in Pakistan and Malaysia were gaining through were gaining within militant institutions. I knew then, as did some of my colleagues and professors, that the diversity and tolerance enjoyed in the United States would not be brooked by fundamentalist societies de developing elsewhere. Yet, to the extent I could determine from my professors, Washington was not particularly concerned of those issues at that time. Nearly a decade later, 1999 to 2000, a Hoosier graduate student of mine conducted fieldwork on education in Afpak settings. He did so as a, uh, uh, as a Boran fellow. His trainings in the religions, cultures, and languages of the Middle East, West Asia, and South Asia eventually led to a career overseeing the uh, Department of Labor's reconstruction efforts in Iraq. It led to directing the Civil Society Division of IREX, and finally running uh, USAID uh, subcontracted projects in South Waziristan and the Yemen. But prior to Al-Qaeda's 2001 uh, attacks, no policy journals were interested in the results of his graduate fieldwork. Fieldwork on how militant Islamist ideology had penetrated school textbooks in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Of course, once the calamity was upon our nation, a summary of his investigations quickly found print as an article under the title A's for Allah, J's for Jihad, uh, World Policy Journal, Spring of 2002. But the knowledge should have gotten out there before. Okay. The lessons for us are obvious in hindsight. Yet the types of observations that only come from studying other cultures closely, from learning about their pasts and their presents, from analyzing and contextualizing their ideas and practices, must be given much great, greater credence as a routine aspect of American foreign policy. There is no substitute for being there in person when studying the developing world and fieldwork is an intrinsic part of the humanities and funding of the humanities. Education in medieval Europe began with the trivium, a Latin word related to the English word trivial. So humanistic learning regarded as so basic as to be indispensable. The trivium comprised of three modes of knowledge, grammar or the structure of language, logic or the systematic use of thought and analysis, and rhetoric, or the application of both language and logic to instruct and to persuade. In our current struggles with Iran's theocracy, it is worthwhile to keep in mind that the trivium still forms the basis of Shiite clerical education in madrasas, having been assim assimilated by medieval Muslim scholars from Greece, Rome, and from pre-Islamic or ancient Iran. Political and religious differences notwithstanding, the humanities can provide a vehicle for and a measure of understanding between seemingly disparate cultures whose leaders and mem members may envision different world orders. During the 20th and 21st centuries, humanities funding has become so trivial to use the term in its common parlance of insignificance so trivial in actual dollar amounts compared to entitlements and defense, that it is easy to overlook the, na the national value derived from the humanities and equally easy to decrease its funding. Yet, like a physical garden in which herbicides are a retroactive means of control, whereas appropriate nutrients are a proactive one, Knowledge remains key to tending social issues before problems develop and to mitigating crises, crises when they occur. Humanities form the wellspring of knowledge. As our moderator has written, necessary in times, in good times and in bad times. 
for making friends and influencing people, and even for eliminating foes. So the humanities and its international focuses must remain integral, integral to the US education and foreign policy systems in order for Americans to surmount global challenges that lie ahead. Shared funding for humanities research by the, between the federal government through agencies like the NEH and state and private academic institutions can provide pathways for meeting national security and cross-cultural challenges in a constantly changing world. Thank you.